This chapter, The Good Neighbor, the story of former Secretary of State Cordell Hull. It was December 1943. The Second World War was raging. Returning from a meeting of the Allies, Cordell Hull addressed the American Congress. Already he was planning for world peace. Before governments declared that they recognized the necessity of establishing at the earliest practicable date a general international organization based on the principle of the sovereign equality of all peace-loving states and open to membership by all such states, large and small. In those words were the seeds of the United Nations. Later, Cordell Hull signed the charter of the United Nations Organization, the climax of a great career. In 1871, Cordell Hull was born in the hills of Tennessee. It was lonely, backwoods country. But Hull's father observed that the boy could think right straight and send him to college. He was elected to the state legislature when he was 20 years old. His fame as a straight thinker was spreading. Then service in the Spanish-American War. Returning from Cuba, the young captain became a circuit-riding judge. Elected to Congress, Powell went to Washington. Except for the war, it was his first sight of the great world beyond the Tennessee hills. But he understood world problems. He fought for lower tariffs in Congress, feeling that the way to obtain world peace was by promoting international trade. Theodore Roosevelt was president when Hull entered Congress in 1907. From the time of Teddy Roosevelt to the time of Franklin Roosevelt, he served as congressman and senator. FDR appointed him secretary of state. As head of the State Department in charge of foreign affairs, Hull had the chance for which he had waited 25 years. He launched his good neighbor policy in an effort to halt the trend toward world chaos. The Great Depression had brought an army of unemployed bonus marchers to Washington. There were riots. Abroad, the rise of dictators was beginning. Adolf Hitler had lied and clubbed his way to power in Germany. He and his brown shirts prepared to bid for world conquest. Benito Mussolini painted a glowing imperial future for Italy and led his black shirts out to conquer unarmed Ethiopia. The League of Nations protested, but aggression went unpunished. Japan began her all-out assault on peaceful neighbors. Manchuria had already been seized. Now bombs and shells fell on China proper. It was murder on a grand scale. Then the first act of outright aggression against the United States. In December 1937, Japanese planes bombed the American gunboat Panay. The ship fought back gallantly. But the odds were too great. The Panay was doomed. Having shed American blood, Japan ordered her ambassador in Washington to express regrets. I am very sorry to receive the report that the American gunboat Hane has been bombed and sunk by Japanese naval airplanes in the Yangtze River above Nankin. It was a great mistake. You accepted the apology for what it was worth and warned that continued aggressions would lead to a second world war. But your warnings were ignored. In 1938, Czechoslovakia was turned over to the Nazis. Hitler entered Prague. A great republic fell without the firing of a shot. Europe moved swiftly toward disaster. A few weeks later, you sailed to attend a conference of American republics at Lima, Peru. Your good neighbor policy had failed to win peace. By now, you felt war was inevitable. But you were determined to stop that war from spreading to the Western Hemisphere. A system of mutual defense had to be set up in advance by the 21 American republics. 
to create that defense program, you would come to Lima. As far as my country is concerned, let no one doubt for a moment that so long as the possibility of armed challenge exists, the United States will maintain adequate defensive military, naval, and air establishment. You succeeded. The American Republic's pledge to unite against the common danger. Now, after a half century of service, your wife asked you to retire, but you were needed to guide American foreign policy in the hard days ahead. November 1941, a Japanese fleet sailed to attack Pearl Harbor. At the same time, Japan sent Saburu Karusu to Washington his mission to dangle the bait of peace while the enemy fleet moved into position. Karusu and Nomura played their game skillfully, dragging out negotiations with Cordell Hall until December 7th. That afternoon, they handed a note from their government to Hull. In that note, Japan accused the United States of provoking war in the Pacific. The minutes ticked away as Hull angrily refuted the Japanese charge, calling it the greatest lie he'd ever heard. Meanwhile, the Japanese dive bombers had taken off from their carriers some 300 miles north of Pearl Harbor. In the gray dawn, they raced toward the unsuspecting target area. Hawaii was asleep as the planes came over. Plenty of time to aim the bombs at the battleships below. Nineteen warships were sunk or damaged. The Pacific fleet was virtually destroyed. Ambassadors Kurosu and Nomura timed their exit well. Pearl Harbor was in flames as they left the State Department building for the last time. Official news of the tragedy had not yet reached Washington. Word came that afternoon by telephone. Asked to address the American people, Hull said, Today, we are living through a dark period. It is in times like this that each of us needs desperately to hold fast to the faith that is in us. Seventy years old, you undertook a huge diplomatic labor, uniting the Allies with all their differences into a wartime team. You wrote the United Nations Declaration, which was signed by the governments. Eloquently, it set forth the ideals for which the Allies were fighting. With Russia's Maxim Litvinov, you signed a mutual assistance agreement. Russia would receive food and arms to continue her resistance to the Nazis. You had fought for the Lend-Lease Act, under which aid was supplied to Britain before Pearl Harbor. Now you signed an agreement with Britain's Lord Halifax pledging military and economic cooperation in war and peace. China was weary after years of Japanese plunder and aggression. With her ambassador, you negotiated a treaty of friendship and assistance. You flew for the first time in 1943, going to the Moscow Conference. You had lived to see travel progress from the horse and buggy to the automobile and the four-engine transport plane. You had progressed from the backwoods of Tennessee to conferences where the fate of the world was decided. Returning from Moscow, you called together the leaders of Congress and revealed plans for a post-war peace organization. Remembering the unhappy fate of the League of Nations, you worked hard to get their support. There were endless frictions to be eliminated. Finally, you won the backing of congressional leaders, but the effort left you exhausted. A few months later, you entered a naval hospital. The terrific strain of 11 hectic years as Secretary of State had brought you to the point of collapse. The doctors ordered complete rest, but you failed to recover. Calling in reporters, you revealed a hard decision. Although you wanted to remain in office and complete the task of forming the United Nations, to do so might be fatal. Regretfully, you announced your resignation as Secretary of State. 
At San Francisco in 1945, the United Nations was born. Hull was too weak to attend. But when President Truman announced the surrender of Japan, Hull had recovered enough to go to the White House. The victory was the vindication of all he had fought for. Now the nations could try again to achieve peace through a worldwide good neighbor policy. Honors were showered on him as father of the United Nations. Receiving the Nobel Peace Prize, he gave credit to his wife. His accomplishments, he said, would have been impossible without her. Then back to the hospital in 1946. Slowly, he recovered and began the writing of his memoirs. The huge undertaking, a personal history of America in war and peace, took years to complete. To the limits of his strength, Hull continued to take part in public affairs, meeting with the president, advising on foreign policy, pleading for the United Nations. Eighty years old, he was the grand old man of American diplomacy. The boy who could think right straight had risen from a log cabin to a place with the greatest of American statesmen. Cordell Hull, the good neighbor. <laughs>